Well, I have been waiting literally for years to do a video on how to get the most you can out of the Morning Star service. I just think that uh, of all the major breakthroughs in technology for me, I think the one of the biggest was having access to all of this information for Morningstar uh, on on mutual funds. I I have never paid for their service, and and Chris, uh, who's here with me, Chris Pedersen, uh, our director of research, uh, who's going to do the heavy lifting as we go through Morningstar's uh, uh, site today. But uh, he actually uh, uses uh, the, uh, the, the service you pay for, I think it's almost $250 a year, to be able to dig deeper. And before we're done, Chris, I want to make sure we get just quickly an idea of how much deeper you have the ability uh, to dig on our behalf. But here is why this is so important to me in wanting you to have as much as you can possibly have to understand this process. It is easy to buy the market. We all can buy the market if we assume the market is the S&P 500. We know the total market index is virtually the same historically as the market, the S&P 500. It too can be bought for nothing or almost nothing in terms of fees. But we also know that when we look at the tables, I was looking this morning at the, the table that shows uh, just the S&P 500 and small cap value. If you start with the S&P 500 and you add 10%, a little bit of small cap value, over the 54 years on the table, it adds about three-tenths of 1%. Now, that is a big deal. I mean, that's a lot of money because of that one small move in your portfolio. But there are a whole bunch of other moves that, that in essence, decisions that you're going to make that are going to lead you to something either more or less productive. And when you get to understand all the different ways that Morningstar will look at mutual funds, you will start to see, ah, now it's easy to see the expenses here and to compare. That's one of the easy ones. But how much of particular assets funds carry? It turns out to be a big deal, according to the academics, claiming that 90 to 99% of the return that we get comes from the asset allocation of the fund. And Morningstar breaks this all down for us. So, uh, Chris, I really appreciate you joining me on this one. And I would like to start. I would I would like to look at that front page the, that I look at every morning when I get up. Uh, I, when I opened this one up this morning, uh, I couldn't believe I was looking at an old friend there. And uh, uh, I think maybe he's recording that uh, interview from... Uh, uh, from Hawaii, but Harold Avensky. I haven't seen Harold in years, and it was uh, um, great um, great to see his face. But over to my left of, of Christine Benz there is the U.S. market barometer that allows me with just a moment, just a, when I see that, I know so much about the factors of uh, uh, of investing. When I say I know so much, it tells me how the market is responding. And some mornings I'll get up, I notice here that that in that style box, there are nine boxes there. And on the left-hand side, those are the value. And on the right-hand side, those are the growth. At the top, of those are the large. At the bottom, those are the small. So we have the size and we have a uh, the value orientation. There are days when the difference, for example, right here, you have the large cap growth up a fifth of 1%, 20 basis points. We see that small cap value 
is down 38 uh, hundredths of 1%, which means there's about a half of uh, a 50 cent different, 50% difference in the change. Uh, I should say half a percent difference mm -hmm. in the change uh, today between those those two asset classes. But there are days when you will see huge differences and that is just one day. And so in a sense, this barometer gives me an idea of how random this market can be. Almost from minute to minute, we also know from the, the, the quilt chart that we produce going back to 1928, from year to year, the difference between these asset classes can be unexpectedly uh, high. And uh, this gives you a kind of a, a quick look one day at a time. So I know we don't make any decisions based on that particular style of box, but I think it's, it makes it easier to understand how these different asset classes are, are doing their own thing. So, Chris, if you would do me a favor, you, of course, dig into this, this information on behalf of the people who follow our work, helping to put together the best-in-class uh, portfolio and, uh, and all the other work that you do. W would you walk us through where on the Morningstar site that you go to work and find uh, what helps you make the decisions? Well, I use Morningstar mostly as a way to be what I would think of as kind of a, gr a grown-up shopper. Uh, when, you know, when I was a kid and I would go to the grocery store, uh, I would see the toucan on the box of Fruit Loops and say, that's the one I want. And I would remember the sugary sweet taste that I got eating it and go back and buy more. And as a grown up, I go into the store and I turn the box on its side and I look at the ingredient list. <laughs> I, I love it. And I go, there's no fiber in here. There's no there's no nutritional content, um, you know, maybe for dessert, you know, but not but not for breakfast. And morning. Uh, there is, by the way, there is a profit in there, Chris. Don't forget, there is a profit. A profit? You mean for for Fruit Loops? For the yeah, they they for have profit. they're getting some good stuff out of that box. Oh yes, they are. You yes, aren't. They are. But but they also they also know that the profit out of Fruit Loops is coming out of selling to parents of small children, and the profit out of uh, All Brand is coming out of selling to old people. Yes. Uh, so. So they know they have these different target markets. And as a grown up, when I buy a stock or a um, more likely a mutual fund or an ETF, I want to know what's inside. I don't want to just know that it says it's a small cap value fund or that it says it's a an S&P 500 or to total market fund and has you know pretty packaging and messaging and a nice website, right? That would be buying like I did when I was a little kid and I liked the toucan on the box. I wanna know what's inside. And that's really what Morningstar does for us. As a shopper looking for securities, it helps us understand what's inside. So let's take, um, just as an example, let's look at the Vanguard total market uh, ETF, uh, which is VTI. And so you you go to the search box, you type in the ticker, and then you click on the the there can be multiple results. But if you click on the one that's in blue, that's got the symbol, that's going to take you to the page that starts to tell you about what's inside, what what this fund actually is. <clears throat> and at the top, they want you to focus on these three stars and the, the gold rating that they've given it. I actually look way, I, I look past that almost immediately because um, although there is some analysis that goes into that selection and criteria and they have a process for doing it, it tends in my experience to value short-term re results. It tends to not be as focused on the intrinsic qualities of the investment that are gonna give you long-term returns uh, that that I'm looking for. So instead, I, I, I skip past that and I go down to um, the numbers that are on this page and then the information that's on a few other of these tabs here. And let's 
Let's start with the description we get out of Vanguard total stock market. We come down here. One of the most important things is expense ratio. So the adjusted expense ratio here or the expense ratio is 0.3%. That's tiny. So that's good. I like that. That means that um, I'm paying less than uh, 0.03 pennies per dollar in uh, invested, right? Is that right? Yep. 1% would be one penny per dollar. So 0.03 yeah. pennies per dollar invested. That's, I'm getting a lot That's of work done for me. This, this fund has a lot of stocks in it and I'm not having to pay very much money. The, the next thing I look at is um, a set of things. It's the, the combination of volume, total assets under management and bid ask spread. Those, those things tell me, is this fund large? Have a lot of people invested in it? Has it been around for a while? Uh, because when you're, especially an ETF, not so much a mutual fund, but an ETF, if those numbers, uh, if the, the assets under management are big and the volume is large, that means that this bid ask spread is going to be small. So 0.01%, again, very, very small. And what that means is that I don't have to be super careful when I'm trading it. I can put in a market order for a purchase or a sale and I'm going to get a price that is very fair for that point in time in the market, where if this bid ask spread was high, let's say it was 1% or 2%, that means that when I place an order, I probably want to place a limit order, and I may actually be paying a tax with each purchase and sale um, to cover that bid ask spread because I'm not as smart and savvy as the best people in the market, and, and they're going to do a little better job at, at, at getting that. So that's the second thing I look at. Then I look at, at yield, um, and uh, I it, it basically is telling me how much of the return am I going to be forced to pay tax on as it, as it goes, uh, because the yield is going to come to me probably as qualified dividends if I've held the stock for a while. And then in a taxable account, I'm going to have to pay tax on it. If it's in a tax deferred account, I can just set the dividends to reinvest and, and then the yield doesn't matter as much. But if the yield is high, say it's 4%, um, which it might be in, say, a small cap value emerging markets fund or something like that, then I'm probably going to want to put it in a tax deferred account and not hold it in a taxable account. Um, Beyond that, I, I tend to actually move off of this page and go somewhere else. But before we do that, Paul, is there anything you want to comment on the, the starting page, like what you do with it? Well, for people who are really interested in a specific uh, issue, uh, just to note that they show you how it opened and they tell you then what it's selling for right the, on the last trade. So it opened at $283.78 and now it's Two hundred and eighty-three dollars and seventy-three cents. So you can you you can see what has happened if you if you care uh, so far uh, today. But uh, I, I, that's not something that I particularly look at. But there's a lot that I don't look at because it doesn't just like you don't look at the star rating. Uh, I'm not really other than that comment about the style box just as a, as a general item. I don't try to track these things carefully every day, um, but 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 it's for people who like it. It's there. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that people who are selling or purchasing uh, are probably tempted to spend more time on this yeah. chart on the left hand side. Is it going up? Is it going down? Yep. And yep, you're right. Based on my own experience that's kind of a waste of time yeah. um but it's human nature you'd rather sell when it's up than when it's down you don't want to be a chump you don't want to be the guy who sold it at the low point in the day right. the truth is you have zero control over it and and so as much as i am a human just like everybody else and i sometimes look at it i don't think it's very helpful right so there are a bunch of other pages here that we're going to skip. There's a chart page, a fund analysis page. Um, 
Sometimes the fund analysis page is interesting because it'll tell you a little bit about how the fund is managed and the methodology. And if you're not going to read the prospectus for the fund, you probably should read the fund analysis page just to see how it's run and what they do. Um, I, yeah. But again, I don't tend to focus on that. I don't tend to focus on the recent performance or past performance uh, or the sustainability or the risk. I come over to portfolio. That's the second place I go. And the reason I do is that, again, I'm really interested in being an adult shopper here. I want to know what's inside the box. And the portfolio page is, in my opinion, on Morningstar, the second most important one, because it tells you, it starts to tell you what's inside. And it tells you that very in, in a variety of ways. So over here on the left-hand side, you have this asset allocation. We would expect, since Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF VTI is a U.S. fund, that it's 100% equities in the United States. And it's 99.12% equities. Um, it's uh, it's uh, almost entirely the U.S. There's 0.6% that are non-U.S. equities. Um, there's point two eight in cash it's not unusual to have a little bit of cash and that is a small amount of cash um, but it is 99 percent what it says it is it's 99 percent u.s equities so this left hand side is a first pass at you know is it is it delivering what it says it is can and i just interrupt for one second yeah yeah Chris? of course that category line to me is is a is a great lesson because uh what do we get out of an index fund we get what we paid for but you'll notice that the that the average fund in the same category large blend is 96 percent in us now that doesn't make the people evil but what there that does tell me is they are not committing all of their money to what they said they were going to commit it to uh also Notice that even the VTI has a little bit of cash sitting around. Yep. You want as little cash as possible sitting around because it's not working. But the average fund in that category has about 1.6% in cash. So th that actually it doesn't move the needle much. But if you sit around with with one and a half to two percent in cash and and you should have been getting 10 percent a year on that, it does add up over time. So uh, uh, you may not see it uh, or notice it if you're buying Fruit Loops. There's a lot of other stuff that's not in there that uh, that may be uh, helping or hurting. But a lot of people don't don't notice that funds may be sitting on a bunch of cash. Anyway, I yeah, sorry and, to interrupt. And that cash position it of 0.28% for Vanguard, I think speaks to the their investor owned characteristics. Carrying cash may be a way for a company to make some more money off you, right? There's there's there there's a lot of there's a lot of trickery that can go on behind the scenes on you know securities lending all kinds of stuff uh that that can reduce what you take home and one of the great things about vanguard is since they are investor owned there's no conflict of interest and i think that low cash position is um partly a reflection of that so yeah, the, the know, sec I, that's interesting uh, that's maybe a topic for another day about uh what they can and can't uh, do with cash and and securities lending but let's do that another day I, yeah I think that's yeah it's topic. yeah i think we should come back to it on another day and specifically it might be interesting to look at in the context of um, zero cost funds because funds that have zero cost in their expense ratio still have to make money <laughs> so how do they do it and securities lending is one of the tools they have yeah. behind the scenes where with Vanguard, if Vanguard does securities lending, there is no shareholder to distribute the money they make off of that too. their securities lending has to go back to the investor. Yep. So again, another another advantage for Vanguard. 
and and I'm not saying every zero cost fund is trying to um, uh, you know shortchange their investors, but they are if they're a for profit firm, they got to make money somehow, and that's probably one of the ways they're doing it. Yep. So the the next place I think both Paul and I we we tend to look is over here at the style box, and Paul started with the style box for the market. This is the style box for these for this investment which is highlighted in blue i'm colorblind tell me if i get colors wrong blue Paul. you're right on okay that one's blue and then you have um the category which is large cap blend which is in is that yellow yep yep okay and then we've got uh the morning star us large mid tr i forget what that is um which is in red i believe right so so the one that we really care about is this blue circle and it tells us where the middle of the, the the kind of the center of this fund is and it's right where you would expect it to be it's a large blend fund and and you might be saying well wait a minute it's total market shouldn't it be a circle that is evenly distributed around all of the boxes all of the squares but it's cap weighted, which means that when you figure out where the middle weight of it is, it's really heavily influenced by those behemoth jar large companies that are up at the top. And so, and this is why a large cap blend fund and a total market fund have almost exactly the same return. It's because so much of the, the capitalization, the cap weight is up at the top. Now, Paul uh, pointed out when we were discussing earlier, um, getting ready for this, that sometimes it's hard to intuit from this circle what it really means, and it's better to switch to weight. So if I switch to weight, you can see how much of this fund is in each of the nine style boxes. And you can see that, yeah, the center is in large cap blend up there with 36% of the, um, the companies in that box. But there's 16% in large growth, 20% in large value. Heck, there's even 3% in small value. So you've got a little bit in a lot of different boxes. And um, you can also look historically at how the style has moved around. I look at this sometimes to see how consistent a fund has been over time um, with a total market index this is less instructive because it's really telling us how the market has evolved but if you look at a small cap value fund and you see it hopping back between small cap value and small cap blend over time that tells you that it's probably not tilted as much towards value or it may be actively managed and the people behind the scenes may be trying to second guess where they should be at any point in time so i look at i look at all three of those but um, I think, Paul, you were saying you like the weight one the best, right? Well, I'll tell you why I like the weight one. Um, if, if in fact, we believe all the academic research that we have uh, uh, accepted, uh, it, it means knowing how much small and even what kind of small it has in the portfolio. A lot of people buy this uh, total market index thinking they're getting the right balance of large and small and value and growth. Well, this style box here tells me not exactly, but as close to exact as I'm going to get, uh, how much of these different asset classes, because if there were some magic to be done, I probably, if I were holding this as a single fund in my whole portfolio, I'd like to make a little, a few changes in the style boxes. And the good news is we can see that being done by other people in, in the industry. Uh, for example, uh, Avantis with their, their uh, AVUS. In fact, since we've got this 2036, 16, et cetera, in our minds, let's just compare that uh, to the Avantis uh, fund in, with that uh, particular portfolio. There we go. Now, now all of a sudden, between mid cap and small, we've got a fair number of uh, higher percentages. That means 
This is not becoming a small cap value fund or a mid cap value fund, but to the extent that somebody wants to see it as a total market kind of, uh, uh, of an operation, this to me is more like I want to see because I like smaller. I like a little more. I want some, particularly for somebody who is saying, this is my fund for the market. I would like to have this amount of small cap and mid cap in the portfolio rather than what's in the total market index from Vanguard. And the research shows that it should make a difference. And by the way, you said that you don't spend much time on chart, but let's go back there for where you were right there. Uh, I'll um, get there in just oh. a second. I'm going to just pull up uh, VTI in a different tab so we can compare them back and forth easily. Oh, okay. So we'll go to the portfolio there. Yeah, so now I can, and I'll put it on weight. And now we can go back and forth easily. So what were you going to say, Paul? Here's where I like chart. And I'd like to, using the Avantis U.S. Equity Fund, the ETF, if you would pull up the chart on, on that one. Also, if you would go to Max, because I want to see, they've only been around for five years. Now I want to compare AVUS with VTI. Now, five years doesn't mean anything, except we're talking about an index fund we're competing with. So at least I'd like to know what impact being smaller, being more value might have had. So if you put in the AVI, ah, So, so AVUS AV, yep. made a little more money. Is it life-changing? No. But this has been a period when very large companies have had great returns. If we go through a period where, where smaller companies have great returns, AVUS is likely to far, when I say far, if if we could get an extra half of 1% over a lifetime using AVUS rather than, than VTI, I think it's an interesting thing to do. We had a meeting this morning where we talked about being careful. We are not your advisor. We are not recommending. We are teaching. In fact, what was it that we're teaching... Uh, we teach, we inform, we teach, we inform, and then you decide. That's it. And do we push a little bit? Well, I'm sure somebody would say I was just pushing on AVUS. But yes, we do, I suspect. But understanding, it's not about the, it's not, it's not about any personality. It's about what is in that portfolio. Sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, no, Back. that's fine. I, I And uh, it is nice that at Morningstar, you can go do these kind of comparisons in their interface quickly, because I, I think sometimes, you know, we we question whether we're we're doing something prudent and we want to see some history. Ideally, I'd really like to see longer history, but we're fortunate here. We're now getting to where AVUS has been around uh, almost five years, right? So uh, yeah, over five years. Yeah, over five years. Yeah, we've yes, got over five, five years. Yeah, over five, just barely. Yeah. But so here's, here's the other beauty: is we have access to DVSVX or DFSVX. That's correct. Correct. That is a that's a fund that goes back to 1993. And I would love uh, um, to, to, to pull that up and go back to 1993 and hit, hit max. Yep. So we've got DFSVX going back to 1993. And what do you want to compare it to? Just for VFINX. Well, do we want to compare it to that or the total market? I guess uh, we can start. You know, we'll start we can't with go VF. back. I don't know that we can. Well, 
Okay, let's do it to the total market. That's fine. I don't know that we can go back that far. Oh, VTSAX. There we go. So not surprisingly, um, DFSVX outperformed, right? Yep. But it, it did so with more volatility and that's what you would expect yeah you can see the yes. volatility it's it's much more zigzaggy <laughs> but look what you can do you can pretend you invested in that uh i know for our granddaughter who was just about two years old we put half the money in in the, the avus and the other half in the avuv so it's half s p uh half in the small cap value but you can notice here that red line basically uh, they they the um, fund itself um let me hang on oh VISAX is is the red obviously but it was outperforming for a while uh, and then if you just go over and check in about 200 2007 over here Chris if you pull that over it'll tell you what it's worth as of 2007 at that point, uh, if somebody had purchased this in 93 and put in $10,000, it would be worth 85462 If you were in VTSAX, it was worth 42883 You think you have just found financial nirvana. And if you just hold on to this, you are just going to, you're going to make a fortune. But look what happened by about 2012 or i'm sorry about 2020 they are virtually at at the same value 117 versus 108 what we don't know is for the next 20 years will it look like 93 through 2013 or will it look like this other period of time a recent, more recent period of time, this is the unknown that we all deal with. It is nice that DFSVX, the small cap value, did better, but it's not nearly as good as we thought it was going to be in 2007 because we thought we were going to be able to double VTSAX because we had just done that. And the market just unfortunately isn't that nice to us but i do believe personally this is maybe you know hopeful uh, we can only be hopeful it's a faith-based uh, industry i am hopeful that by the time i die i'm gonna have seen another good run in small cap value well and, and history suggests that you've got a good shot at that yeah that's what they say let's go back to your the page that you like to use uh, by the way, I might say you could show four or five other funds right here. Right. Uh, they yeah. just have to go back to 1993 in order to make the the comparisons meaningful. Well, let's let's go back to the VTI portfolio yep. page. Yep. So we're going to scroll down a little bit here and take a look to the um, to the bottom, just underneath the the style boxes. We get some numerical measures of what's inside the fund what's going on we get price to earnings and we can look at the investment compared to the compat the category average and and uh, this is back on vti so this is basically the whole market and not surprisingly the investment and the category average are very close it's right around 22 um, and that's just a reflection of how expensive the market is today. You also get price to book. And again, you wouldn't expect this to be low because this isn't a value fund. So price to book for the average asset in the market is around four. Um, VTI has a little bit of advantage compared to the category average. Um, now, now, Chris, can we just quickly go over and look at AVUS and compare it, PE and price to book? Sure. So Important yeah. comparisons. So 17.3 PE ratio versus 22 plus. 
three uh, versus uh, 1.8 on the price to book? Uh, so three for 3.8 for VTI and 3.07 or three, yeah, 3.1 uh, right. for right. Avantis. Right. So a Avantis. little bit better. Yep. Uh, dividend yields 1.6, 1.4, pretty close. So you, you get some idea, and then we can also look at market cap in that table. So the average market cap in VTI is 195.49 billion, and the average market cap in AVUS is 105 billion. So quite a bit smaller weighted Our company yes. size yeah yes and yet 105 billion for the average is a pretty it's a big company i mean if you oh, very big two, yes i'm not asking you to look at the two portfolios you could but you'll notice they both own microsoft they both own facebook they both it's it's not about whether they own them it's how much they own and you can see that on VTI, if you scroll down, you see yeah. Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Amazon are the top four at roughly six, six, five, three are the percentages. And on yeah. AVUS, it's Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Meta, slightly different ordering. And it's five, 3.6, 3.4, 2.5. So AVUS is weighting these mega caps less. And, and that's just part of their methodology to tilt towards quality, small value, to do things in the portfolio systematically, like an index fund would, um, in a way that hopefully in the long run increases returns and according to academics, increases expected returns. Yep. So the other thing that we have here to the left are these these uh, kind of like you can think of them almost like thermometers, right? They're little sliders that go up and down. And these these are probably as much like the nutrition indicators on the side of the Fruit Loops box as anything, because they're telling us that this fund VTI is fairly neutral right in the middle in terms of its tilt towards value or growth. It, it doesn't tilt either way. It's the total market. That's what you would expect. Yeah. It tells you in terms of momentum, it's near the middle, quality near the middle, uh, size right in the middle. And if you look at AVUS in comparison, what you would expect is that, ah, it tilts a little bit towards value. Um, it has, let's see, in terms of momentum, they're about the same. In terms of quality, yeah, this not is slightly better. In terms of size, it's definitely smaller. So you're getting some insights into how the fund might be a little bit different. Uh, it's not numerical, but it's giving you a flavor for whether it's giving you more exposure to some of these attributes that historically have delivered higher expected returns and higher actual returns in the past. So when you see this, um, putting your academic hat on, uh, would you, if you had a choice for my granddaughter, and you wanted some total market exposure as a part of the portfolio, um, would you choose AVUS over VTSAX or VTI? I would. And, and that's why it's my best in class recommendation. And the reason is <clears throat> that if you take the historical expected return or the historical returns for these various attributes, and you multiply them times the difference in exposure that you get, the amount of increased expected return is greater than the amount of additional expense ratio that you're going to get. So in, in, my, uh, in my analysis of the side of the box, if you will, I think there's enough more nutrition to justify the added cost. 
And I, I also really like for your, for your granddaughter in particular, a total market as part of their portfolio, because it lets you teach them as they grow up that every company they do business with that is a public traded company is something they have a stake in. You know, when they fall in love with Legos, you can tell them you own a bit of that. You know, when they fall in love with McDonald's, you can tell them you own a little bit of that. Now, that doesn't mean that you make enough money off the McDonald's Happy Meal that we should go buy them all so that you make more money. But it does mean that when millions of other people buy Happy Meals and when millions of other people go to work, that you you participate in the success of that company. And that's a kind of cool story to be able to tell a young person. That's great. Yeah. You know, um, go back up for just a sec, if you will, to the or go to the measures, style measures. The over here on the right, yes. Uh what yeah, there we go. Um we didn't we're not going into the the all the different uh implications of sales growth, cash flow growth, book value growth. Uh, there, these are all measures that people would consider uh, about a company when they were deciding whether they want to own that company. But I, but I think you'll find this is important. I don't think you give growth up when you use a more broadly diversified uh, uh, total market index. Uh, in fact, it appears to me uh, that the that the uh, the, the cash flow growth and the book value growth uh, were uh, as good or, uh, let's look at VTI for a second there. Let's see. That's book where we value. are. We're on VTI. Oh, v okay. And how does it compare? So to VTI, you've got 7.78% uh, sales okay. growth. And in comparison, AVUS had... 8.26% sales growth, a little bit higher. Yep. And DFSVX, which is the uh, DFA small cap value, had 6.22. So what I see in that is a little bit of a an, an advantage to AVUS because of their emphasis on the financial or the the yeah, the financial quality or strength of the organizations that they invest in. Um, and you see that, I think, in some of the other metrics like cash flow growth, VTI, the total market, 8.74, AVUS, 14.3, DFSVX, 10.9. So I, I think AVUS, what you're seeing there is some of their weighting towards better financials. Yep. So... Can we go to, to, is there anything more on this page you want to make note No, of? no, that's, that's, that's it. We'll go back to VTI. And did you want to go to price next? Yes, I would. Yeah, let's go to price. A lot of people are not aware that under price, uh, you can see the three-year tax cost of owning uh, the fund. Uh, you can also see that it's sitting on a 50% potential capital gains exposure, um, which is probably uh, because they've been around for a long time uh, and they've managed it to try to keep from paying uh, capital gains as best they can. Uh, if we look at that, um, if we look at VTSAX, we looked at this earlier. This is amazing. The mutual fund is is a little more than a, a third of 1% annual tax cost. On 0 0.37, return, yep. 0 0.37. Uh, the average category, this, these would be actively managed funds, uh, 1.44. So people- That's a lot actually, of your return being chewed up in taxes. Yeah. Yes, unnecessarily. So um, can you think of- Anything more that that you would like to? Sh I mean, there is tons of information here about risk and and return. Um, uh, let's see if there's anything. 
Well, well I, uh, on the portfolio page, sometimes I I do like to go down farther and look oh, okay. at the the number of holdings. Yep. So VTI has three thousand six hundred and fifty three holdings. Yep. Yeah, I, I think once you get past, you know, one to 200, I'm going to call that a very broadly diversified fund. But um, again, back to your granddaughter, it's nice to have thousands of companies in there because it's uh, it's easier to teach with that. Yep. Um, if we look yep. at AVUS and we go down there, they have 2200 holdings. Yep. Uh, DFSVX, if we go down and look at that, they have uh, 989 holdings, which is it's not unusual as you get into small cap value that there are fewer companies um, in in a portfolio. Uh, just just for grins, I'm going to take a look at uh, AVUV uh, because that's. I think the, it's about 900, as I recall. But let's see. I would expect it to be similar to DFSVX um, to the DFA fund. So if we scroll down there, yeah, 736. So it's okay. a little bit smaller. I still think it's it's great. You can also look at the turnover percentage for a small cap value fund. I think 7% is quite good. That's AVUV. If you look at DFSVX, um, their turnover percentage. 8%. 8%. So both of them, I, I would say, very good. And... Uh, Let's take a look back at VTI, their turnover percentage. Very low. 2%. Very low, 2% because it's total market. So basically, you just have companies that are going out of business or being created and getting large enough to be included. So there's a lot of different ways you can cut this in a lot more detail. And if you want to dive in and spend time on it, I, there's there's plenty here. Again, I'm going to go back to my overall theme. I think that adult buyers look at what they buy before they buy. And I think Morningstar is, if you only had one Swiss Army knife tool to do that, Morningstar would be my first choice go to. It's a great place to learn a lot and become an informed investor before you purchase a fund or an ETF. And, and to, and to be a bit harsh about the industry, I think everybody in this industry understands what Morningstar offers. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that a majority of people in the industry, and I'm I'm talking insurance industry and the Wall Street and the investment advisors, they all know about this, and yet they reach into this this database and many of them end up selling funds with high expenses funds with less diversification funds that are less tax efficient and the thing that you need to understand is they know exactly unless they're an absolute newbie just hasn't had time to to, to learn this stuff this is not difficult to understand and I think that that Morningstar, uh, what more do you get, Chris, when you pay that two hundred and forty nine dollars a year? What more do you get from the from the, uh, the, the getting past the paywall? There are some analyses of funds that I get, which are helpful, uh, n not in that they drive my choice, but sometimes it's nice to. Uh, to read what what their analysts thought of particular issues. Sometimes there are changes in the management, the stewardship of a fund, the indexes um, that comprise a fund. And it's interesting to be able to read Morningstar's professional analysis of what they think of that. Probably the most important thing, though, is the x-ray, the ability to... Uh, create a portfolio and then have it characterize that portfolio. It's almost like it takes a portfolio, which is an allocation to a lot of different individual individual funds, and then tells you the attributes we just looked at for yeah. a fund. It, it analyzes it almost like a fund and it tells you where it sits on the style boxes, what the overall price to book, price to earnings, 
um, expense ratio, uh, size of company are. So it, and, and, that's and very just, helpful. And that let, does play into what I publish on the best in class yes. ETFs a lot I'm of the just time. Just going to yeah. bring that up that that will all be done when you have your, your, your new recommend, your new, not recommendations, <laughs> suggestions. For people, well, they are consider. they are rec they they are the funds that we choose that we recommend, but they are not um, personal advice, right? So, so, so here I am, dedicated to this amazing wife who I've said, I promise I'll be done by eleven thirty. I noticed by my watch that I have less than thirty seconds because I've got to keep this promise. This one's important. Chris, you did a great job. Uh, I hope people will hit us with questions. We would love questions. By the way, in the note field, because I know you put together the notes for these, would you do me a favor and put the link in for the, you did a presentation on using uh, the other service that you, I can a visualizer. Yes. Let's make sure they get that so they get both. Okay. we Will do. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Thank you, too. Bye -bye. And then all of you who are kind enough to join us, thank you as well. We, uh, we, we love having you be there. Bye now.